I know I've got a loud voice, but we're going to turn it up anyway. So, uh, my name's uh, Greg Breaking. I'm the superintendent of Beaver High School. I wanted to thank everybody uh, for coming tonight, uh, taking uh, time out of your busy schedule. Um, I think this is uh, pretty important information. We want to pass this along. So, thank you guys for coming up. Uh, you're going to hear from some experts tonight, local experts, that are going to talk about a plan that we put together. Uh, we spent probably most of this school year meeting um, throughout the year on this plan. And so uh, uh, this is for preparedness for any kind of crisis, uh, whether it's an evacuation or a lockdown at any one of the schools or in the community. Um, the people that were involved with this, I want to introduce them. Uh, first off is uh, Police Chief to my left, uh, Mike Schutzenhofer from the Beaver Police Department. Uh, Joe Bellavo is from Bellavo Professional Services and Active Shooter Education Consultant. Uh, Lisa Beeling is from the Village. Um, Hans Miller and the Beaver Fire Department are also involved in the planning. John Cohen, Shane Krause are both from the Beaver Public Works Department were involved. Uh, Tony Funderburg, uh, Matt Trout, and Eugene Kramer, Julie Polston, all from the Village. Uh, we're involved. Fritz Holcomb to my right is the Transportation Director for Freeburg Smithton and soon to be St. Lavore Schools. Uh, Mrs. Tommy Diefenbach to my right is the Superintendent of Freeburg Grade School. Uh, Mr. John uh, Coral couldn't be here tonight. He's the Principal of St. Joe's Catholic Church. Uh, Mrs. Jill Jung to my right is the Principal of Freeburg High School. Uh, just to kind of give you an idea of some of the things that we've done in the last Oh, several years to try to um, keep the schools safe. Um, all the schools um, have conducted extra lockdown drills um, and active shooter drills. We'll continue to do those. Uh, we just did one in February, uh, training from the police. Uh, we have uh, the schools are all locked down during the school day, so you have to buzz to get into the buildings. Um, we have reduced the number of entrances in the morning, and both of those entrances are supervised by administration. Um, we've installed double-sided locks in our classroom, so teachers now have a universal key. They, uh, it doesn't matter where they're at, they can pull students into the classroom and lock the doors. Uh, the grade school also has locking mechanisms for all their classrooms. Um, unfortunately, this is kind of just a sad state of where we are in the world today that we have to take these steps and then we have to spend this kind of money. Um, but it's important that we keep our students safe, uh, keep our staff safe. And uh, so after we get done with the presentation, any one of us will be happy to uh, answer questions that we can for you. Uh, but at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Bellavo and Mr. Schutzenhofer. We're going to do the presentation for you. Thank you. Um, like I said, this has been kind of a, a nightmare of mine, uh, hoping that this day never happens. And I've been in the, the high school, grade school, uh, St. Joe's, and going over planes with them and basically telling the teachers, you have to train yourselves. In law enforcement, we go through a ton of training. The fire service, they go through training and a lot of it is reputation. And that's where we've done with the teachers. Um, to elaborate on that, last week, or two weeks ago, we did our intruder drill at the grade school. Um, went great. Went to the primary school. Was even better. We're getting our message across. Had a two-year-old that locked, held the door closed in a closet. We went by, thought it was locked, Later in, going back, checking it again, and one of the officers really pulled on the door, and here's this kid. He was hiding. We're like, what are you doing? My teachers taught me trooper drill. I got to barricade myself, and I hid. I asked him, are you scared? He's like, nope. That's what I was told to do, and gave him a high five. So I think we're getting our message across. What Joe's going to present is the stuff that we've been working on. Um, it's not in detail, but it's enough information to give to you people uh, to take home. So, Joe. Thank you. All right, so 
when Mike asked me to be involved in this, um, we have a consulting business, and the guy I work with is probably, Kurt Everman is probably one of the most well-known active shooter instructors, count consultants in the area. He trains a lot of law enforcement, a lot of, a lot of personnel. And what we discovered by doing our research that schools and businesses are being trained on the actual incident, but we're not preparing properly for it, we're not educating properly for it, and we're not even addressing the aftermath of it. So when we, when I was asked to be on this, we decided, uh, Mike and I, and, and the administration decided that we're gonna attack every angle. We're gonna put a critical incident plan together, and we're gonna try to address every single thing we could possibly address. We know that in a critical incident, whether it doesn't matter what type of critical incident, it's gonna be chaotic. But like Mike said, police, we train, SWAT team trains. Our SWAT teams are tactically the soundest, and why are they the tactically the soundest? Because they train and they train and they train and it's embedded in their minds. When critical incidents and stressful situations happen, people do not focus and they don't concentrate. They lose, they, they lose sight of what's, what they should be doing or what should be happening. So our focus is to get it into somewhat of a routine where we have people, when, the, when critical incidents happen, those people that lose focus, all they need is someone to remain focused have a plan and give them instruction. And when they're given instruction, most of the time, they'll follow that instruction. So with our educators and our administration, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to embed it in their mind so they're the ones that take control, give focus, and, and we keep as many kids safe as we possibly can, and employees safe, and anyone else. Um, we know this is gonna be chaos, we know it is. But the more we plan, the more we train, the more we educate, the less chaotic it's gonna be, and hopefully, the more lives we save. So I'm gonna go through this. Um, this is not the entire critical incident plan. Some of this critical incident plan is being kept confidential, and that's for the safety of the employees and the safety of our students. We, we're not gonna give you certain information, but there's certain information we want you to have, and there's certain instructions that are gonna be difficult to listen to and difficult for you to follow, but we have to have you guys following, and that's one of the things, one of the reasons we want to have this education night, to, to, to help you guys help us deal with the situation in the event that it happens. So some of the bigger incidents that have happened, and, and we're talking active shooters at this point, Columbine was really the first big one, right, that anybody knew about? And law enforcement's theory at that point was surround and negotiate with these people. That theory is long gone. Theory is long gone now. It doesn't matter if it's one officer or five officers. We are trained now, we're gonna go in and we're gonna deal with the threat, and I'll get to that in a minute, but that's our job, is dealing with the threat. So some of the things we looked at, putting in a critical ops plan that we debriefed on is lack of education, preparation, and training. We need to train a lot of these people. There is a, has anyone seen the public, um, I guess it's a PowerPoint that was put together on the Parkland shooting? Parkland, Florida, has anyone seen that? It is frightening, it is absolutely frightening. There were so many mistakes made during that incident and it all falls down on lack of education, preparation and training. Um, there were law enforcement mistakes, there were school mistakes. There was, this, this child knew that 30 minutes, 20 minutes before the bell, bell rang, that the gates around the school got unlocked. So he waited for the unarmed security guard to unlock those gates, and he walked through carrying a rifle bag. There was three times within the first four or five minutes that someone had a chance to lock the school down and didn't do it. And it would have been a whole lot different results if we would have. So we need to train our police, we need to train our educators, we need to train our students, and we need to train the community. We need to train the community and the parents and the spouses of the people who are here. And that's the purpose of tonight. The notification, Mike has, and the, and the schools have worked out a great notification system. I can tell you, I'm not gonna go into great detail, but I can tell you soon it'll be up and running. Is that fair, Mike? Soon it'll be up and running where it's gonna be instant notification from our school to the police department and to the city officials. Immediate notice. They are going to know that something is happening in any one of the schools that happen. The other notification issues that happen 
on some of this research was the seriously injured or the children that were killed or the employees that were killed. It was sometimes taking 24 hours for the parents to be notified. That's completely unacceptable. So we, are, we have put steps in place to improve that, and hopefully there won't be, um, but we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Media, the media, keeping the media out. We don't want to keep the media out, but we want to send the media. We have a staging area for the media. It's going to be at the police department, and that's where we're going to deal with the media and try to keep this area free. Secondary incident locations. We have several set up. So when I mean secondary incident locations, what I refer to is, let's say a classroom can escape. The teacher takes the 20 kids, whatever the case may be, and escapes. There are secondary locations that we have planned, depending on the incident, depending on the school, and those are the ones we're not, those are confidential as well. We're not telling those. We're trying to avoid a second, second location of a critical incident. So those are, those are we're keeping confidential. But what will happen at those spots is the kids that can get out will get out, they'll be relocated to that spot. When the situation is secure, whatever that means, the situation is secure, then they will be transported to a location, and we'll talk about it here in a minute, but they're gonna be transported to a location which is where they're gonna be released. But that's not gonna be until the situation is secure. And then lockdowns, like I said, the lockdowns, um, who can call a lockdown? And we've discussed that with the last training with the, with the schools, who can call a lockdown? And I think, uh, you know, anybody can call a lockdown, I think is, is, is the thoughts of most of the schools. Because in the Parkland issue, they thought only two people could call a lockdown. So no one called a lockdown. They just kept radioing to other people. And that person would radio to another person who would radio to another person. And the school, it was six, seven minutes before the school got locked down. There were 20 something kids killed at that point. So like I said, our, our training and our critical incident plan deals with preparing for any critical incident, surviving the incident, and the aftermath. Are we prepared? We have looked at policies. We've created this critical incident plan, which covers just about everything. It is covering realistic training, and not one time realistic training. It's covering, how many times have you been to the schools to do training this year? Multiple? Probably over half a dozen to a dozen. We can't train and get it embedded in teachers' or students' minds unless this is a continuing thing, unless we're continually doing this. And it continues from year to year. And that's the way the ops plan is written, that we will, we will graduate with the times as they change. We might tweak our training depending on what happens and what the, what the current trait of, of critical incidents is, but we will continue to train. And we're going to make it realistic. We're not going to sit them in a classroom and just leave them in a classroom and say, five minutes from now, there's going to be a critical incident. You guys all go around to the corner. That's not realistic. That's not where these shootings are happening. Parkland. Fire alarm went off, right? That was his plan. His plan was to make the fire alarm go off, and when these kids got in the hallway, he knew there were gonna be dozens and dozens of kids in the hallway. When these critical incidents happen, especially active shooters, they're looking for a large target of audience, right? They're looking for a lot of people. So that's where we have to train. We have to train in the classroom, that's important, but we also have to train in the cafeteria here. We have to train in the gym, we have to train on PE, if they're out of the, out of the football field, we have to train everywhere and teach these children and the, and the educators to have a plan when this happens, have a plan. Um, educating everybody involved, we talked about that, including the parents, including the spouses. Um, relationship with law enforcement and first responders. What we mean by that is getting these first responders, getting these law enforcement guys into your schools. I can tell you that the state police, two, three years ago, used the high school here, I think. I'm not sure if they've used the primary school, but they've used the high school here. And what that means is that means 100 officers about came to this school and did their annual rapid, rapid deployment training here, which means there's 100 officers that are familiar with the layout of this school. That's huge. So that's what, we, that's what we encourage. We encourage schools to call their law enforcement partners. And I know Freeburg's doing, uh, I know they're coming through here a lot and showing a big presence, but it's important that we know the layout of the schools. We have a critical incident plan in place, and we aren't, like I said, we're not releasing that because there is confidential information involved. So what are the, what are the responsibilities for the managers, for the admin, for the schools? Institute Access Control, we were just talking about that. 
Uh, it's not perfect right now, but we're, we're steadily improving and we're, we're, we're looking to have it as controlled as possible at all times. I know the police department was given full access to all of the schools, is that correct? So Freeburg PD has full access to the schools anytime. That's most important. The last thing we want is for Freeburg PD to show up at a critical incident and not be able to get through the door, right? So they have been given full access. Um, critical items, the, the access to it, the floor plan, stuff like that. Assembly kits, we talked about part of that assembly kit. It's not just, you know, a first aid kit. It's what is gonna help us with this situation. I talked about Mike had Mike and the fire department, I believe, have worked out a system where it's going to be immediate notification. That's huge. That's part of the crisis kit. The floor plans, student rosters, and at least for the high school, eventually we're all going to have ID cards. That's going to be huge. Um, and I know I'm not sure about the grade schools or St. Joe's, but I know the the high school, the teachers were issued emergency bandage which is a great tool in the event of someone getting shot or someone getting seriously injured. Educate school faculty. What are they responsible for? What should they do with their students? So I can tell you that doing these, the teachers are like, you got to give us, you, you have to give us a black and white plan. What should we do? We can't, we can't do that. You know, every single situation is different. What we can do is we can look at the teacher's area where they're at and we can say okay you're on the south end of the school if someone comes across the the intercom and says there is a, a shooter in the gym you have to look at what access how, how can you get out we teach our we teach every law enforcement agency in the country teaches run hide fight right run hide fight if you can get out get out if you can't hide and if you have to fight fight so if you can run, get out. So if someone comes across the intercom saying there is an active shooter in the gym, and you're down here in the hallway, and you have kids that are capable of getting out with you, then your plan is probably going to be to exit out the door, right? Head to the secondary location. If the fire alarm's pulled, we're not teaching anymore to instantly run out the door. They have to evaluate, and they have to make a decision. And I think we're all in agreement that. They have to make the decision based on the facts they know, based on the facts they're given, and they have to make the best decision possible. Regardless of what that decision is, they have to make the best decision for them and their kids. And they're gonna be responsible for doing that based on everything they know, based on their classroom. But the thing we have them doing now is we have them thinking. They were asking great questions when we were here last time about, you know, getting out the door, getting into the fenced-in area. I mean, just great question. So their minds are turning. So I know that they're running these scenarios through. And that's half the battle, having a plan and being ready if something happens. Students, we talked about realistic training. Um, parents and spouses. Parents and spouses, most importantly. Here's how it'll probably play out in a critical incident. It doesn't matter what type of critical incident. There's going to be parents that get notified by text message, right? text message, phone call, you hear about them every critical incident. And what's the parent going to want to do? Come here, right? Come in here. This is what we can't have. If you guys take nothing else away from this, I assure you, you the child is not going to be released to you here. It's not going to happen. It can't happen because we have a process in place. You're going to want to come here. Hopefully you're not going to make it here, even if you try, because we're going to have we have a plan, we have it set up where you're not going to have access to it. But if you do, you're not going to get your child. And what you're going to do is you're going to cause more harm than good because you're going to be blocking the ambulances, you're going to be blocking the fire department, you're going to be blocking the buses to get the kids where we're busting the kids, you're going to be blocking law enforcement. And you're honestly, we don't know who you are. We don't know who you are. So if you try to come in the school, that's not a good scenario. So um, we need you to respond somewhere else, and I'll talk to, about that here in a minute. Um, and then attending these types of trainings, I, I'm, I'm thrilled with the response we got. That, that's huge. We love it. Um, and this stuff should be ongoing. I think we talked, and I think the school's going to do this for all the incoming new parents um, that are coming into any of the schools. We're going to put it as part of the freshman orientation or whatever the case may be in the future. Um, and hopefully, hopefully that will happen. Handling threats. It's a different day and age, right? 
different day and age. Our opinion is every threat should be taken seriously. And our opinion is the school should not be making the decisions on these threats. They should be referred to an outside agency or a law enforcement agency. I'm not saying the law enforcement agency isn't going to work with the school because they are, absolutely. But what we're trying to do is take the emotion or take some of the emotion out of there. Doesn't matter who the child is, it should be dealt with seriously. And law enforcement is going to today's day and age, they have to get involved. I mean, there's no way around it. So, school will probably notify the law enforcement agency or an outside agency, whatever they decide. Most likely it's going to be Mike and his crew. Um, if it's a credible threat, what's going to happen is that child is probably going to be taken into custody. And that probably going to be referred to the state's attorney's office. The state's attorney's office is the is the office that's going to make the decision on whether this child is charged, whether he needs to get evaluated, whether he's not charged. It is not law enforcement's decision to make. To make that is the state's attorney's decision. They issue all charges. So all we will do is, or all law enforcement will do, is refer that over to them with the reports and let them make the decision. If it's unsubstantiated threats or there's no criminal violation, the police really don't have any jurisdiction. So it'll be referred back to the school, school board, whatever the, however the school is gonna handle that. Understanding critical incidents. So these things happen very, very quick, right? Most school shootings are over within minutes, within minutes. Um, our training is focused on making the teachers, getting the teachers in a mindset that they're gonna survive those, those five, six, seven minutes, whether it's run, whether it's hide, they are going to survive. Each classroom has its own advantages, each classroom has its own disadvantages. The teachers have to know that, and the teachers have to have a plan right now of what they're gonna do in the event that this starts unfolding, and have several plans in case it unfolds differently. Um, they, the teachers have equipped themselves with some tools, with some stuff in their classroom to help protect them, help protect the kids. And that's just the reality of it. Um, media notification to the police, we talked about that. If it's not at, say, the incidents here at the high school, the grade school, primary school, St. Joe's, will be notified immediately. They're going on lockdown. You cannot respond to those schools either because they are not, those kids are not gonna be released. Every single person that's available is going to be dealing with this high school and they're gonna be dealing with um, releasing these kids, treating these kids, getting the buses in, getting the buses out. And our, our last concern at that point is the other two schools that are secure and locked out. Means no one's coming in, no one's coming out. But the teachers will be notified that the incident is not at their school, but their school is being placed on lockdown. City officials, we have a map, and we already have it laid out every street that's gonna be shut down. Where they're gonna be shut down, who's gonna shut it down. So when the city gets notification that there is an incident at the high school, they know, go get what they need, shut down the area. The only people coming in and going out, police, ambulances, fire department, emergency personnel, that's it. No one else is coming in, no one else is coming out. There will be a pre-recorded message that the city has put together, and it will go out to all the residents in Freeburg and all the residents in Smithton. And it's basically gonna say that there was an incident at the high school, there was an incident at the grade school, whatever the case may be, and respond to Adam's auction. That's gonna be our release point. Respond to Adam's auction to pick up your child. Do not, and it'll emphasize do not respond to the school. It will also say that the other schools are on lockdown or you can assume that they're on lockdown and you should not respond to those schools either. You're gonna to respond to Adam's auction. Designated bus routes are in place. Again, that's something we're not gonna talk about. We're not gonna create more issues for ourselves, but they are in place. Fritz has them down pat. He knows what he's doing with one of the buses. He's gonna hold the buses when we're ready for the buses to come in. We have a route for them to come in, pick up the kids, and we have a route to get the kids to Adam's auction. Law enforcement troll. Like I said, Columbine, law enforcement troll. At that point, it was surrounding call out, basically, was the theory. That's not the theory anymore. The theory is eliminate the threat. If law enforcement comes in and there's three kids hurt, and the threat is still real, they're gonna pass those kids up. They're gonna go to the threat. 
Our job is to eliminate the threat, and our job is to make the casualties as small as possible. So we are going to go eliminate that threat. Once the threat is eliminated, they're going to secure the rest of the school, school and they're going to start triaging the injuries. Ambulance personnel will come in, medical personnel will come in, firemen will come in, and we will start triaging the injuries and getting, we have places for helicopters to land if we need helicopters for medical treatment. We have ambulances that will be coming. We know where they're going to stage, depending on which school. Um, so we'll start triaging and getting those patients out. Any kid that leaves for medical treatment, that they will be documented. You will be notified if your kid has left for medical treatment. One of the school uh, administrators is going to be responsible for documenting which, who left for medical treatment and which hospital they went to. And then we're going to process the scene afterwards. We're going to process the scene. The school's going to, I mean, if it's a shooting situation, the school will be shut down for a long period of time. Reporting procedures. This was one of the issues, and this is what we're trying to, one of the things that we're trying to focus on and trying to get you as parents, get you guys notified as quickly as possible. Same with spouses, as quickly as possible. That doesn't mean in 30 minutes we're going to know, because we're probably not. But what we don't want is we don't want you waiting 24 hours to find out where your child is or where your spouse is. One of the things that Greg is putting, Greg and Jill are putting in place are ID cards for the students. That will help. I can assure you, if there is a shooting in the school or a critical incident where a lot of kids are injured in the school, the faculty is not going to be allowed back in the school to, to help us identify people. That's just not going to happen. So we need any process we can think of put in place to help expedite this and ease your minds the best we can. If your child is, let's say, out on the football field at recess or PE or out on the playground at PE, and a critical incident breaks out and they run home. There is a number to call, 618-539-5705. That is the City Hall, City Hall, is it City Hall? City Hall, one of the city employees will be responsible for either answering that call or at least checking a recording if they're overwhelmed with calls. If your child makes it home, we need to know your child makes it home safe so we can eliminate that person as someone that's critically injured. What they're going to want, they're going to want the location of your child at home, 1234 Main Street, whatever the case may be. They're going to want the name, student ID, if they have a student ID, and a callback number. A callback number where we can call and um, confirm if there's a question. Child pickup process. This is important. Again, do not come to school. I know you're going to want to. I know it's going to be very, very difficult not to come to the school, especially if you get a text message from your child saying they're in the school. I know it's going to be tough, but there is nothing you are going to be able to do up here at the school. The only thing you're going to do is you're going to complicate the situation for the police, the ambulance, fire department, everyone else involved. The best thing you guys can do is respond to Adams. Adams Auction is the place, once this is secure, and keep in mind, most scenes in five to seven minutes so realistically in 20 to 30 minutes this place will probably be secure and we can start transporting kids to Adams as soon as it's secure so if you're not even in town then you're not going to be here in 20 minutes so there's a good chance your child's not even going to be here at the time the other thing we want to emphasize is just because another parent's getting a text message from their child and you're not don't assume the worst Child could have dropped the phone, left it in the classroom, whatever the case may be. Head to Adams and we will update people as quickly as possible that we can. When you get to Adams, there will be somebody directing traffic the best we can. Parents, spouses, they're going to be directed to the big parking lot out back. Emergency personnel, students, uh, employees um, will be guided, directed to the front parking lot. The kids will then be brought in the building, processed, and then released to a legal guardian or someone that is authorized to pick the child up. So if you need to update your authorization, update it. Because it's, it, it, just because of this critical incident, these guys, am I right? They're not going to release kids to just anybody just because of the situation. 
is going to have to be somebody that is authorized to pick those kids up. Um, I, I don't know how fast this is going to happen. I can tell you it's going to be chaotic, but because we have a plan, I think it's going to be less chaotic. And I promise you, nobody wants to keep you waiting. None of us want to keep you waiting any longer than we absolutely have to. And we will get that notification out there as quickly as we possibly can. So keep that in mind. Media. The media is going to be directed to City Hall and we will be giving them updates. The city is going to handle the updates immediately. They're just going to give a brief um, overview of what happened to the media. Once a public information officer, probably be, I don't know, I don't know what department, but once a public information officer arrives, they will probably take over those medias or, or the chief will take over those medias depending on what happens. But they're all going to be up at the police department doesn't mean they're not going to show up at Adams. We're not letting them in the fenced-in area at Adams. They're going to be, they're going to remain outside the fenced-in area. Um, but it doesn't mean they're not going to be there and they're not going to be videoing. We want Adams emphasized. We truly do because we don't want people coming here. We want to get the kids to you as quickly as possible. And the last thing I have, you know, surviving one of these incidents, you know, if we've prepared and we've educated, it's going to be very difficult. But if we haven't prepared and we haven't educated ourselves and taken the steps to educate everyone, it's going to be nearly impossible for all of us to, to deal with the situation. I applaud Freeburg in a whole, as a whole, the school, the, the city, I applaud them because there are not a lot of people that are looking at this and preparing like they have prepared. So I, I think that's a, that, that says big things about their, their dedication to the safety of the employees and the and the students here. Anybody have any? Anybody have any questions? I think we can field any questions that anyone might have. Just ask. Where is Adams? Adams Auction. Adams Auction. So Adams Auction is right up the street, um, kind of by Green Mountain 15. It's Adams Auction Event Center. Tractor, tractor Supply. Right next to Tractor Supply. So if you go out of town towards Eckert's, it's on the left. Anyone have any other questions, comments, concerns at all? Yes? Is any of our staff armed? Um, no. No, it's right now it's illegal to have firearms in school. Unless you're You didn't have firearms in school as long your district allows it and it's not it's state by state. Your schools already I'd have to look at it, but I don't think it's uh... Yes. Uh, neither school has what we would call an SRO. So this, this, you get into a lot of legal issues when you start uh, talking about who's at the school and what their roles are. Um, I think the great school just um, agreed to have uh, the Freeburg police come by, I think it's 20 hours a week, randomly, throughout the week. Uh, the high school does not have that. We do, um, the officers do come by on a fairly regular basis, but we do not have um, an agreement with the police department to do that right now. Why not? <laughs> Uh, you know, these are difficult questions. Some of it has to do with um, the legality of what that person can do, what their role would be, um, what, you know, when something happens at school, does it become a police issue, does it not become a police issue? Um, one of the, the issues that we have at the high school is we've got 23 openings in the school. Um, so we've, we've taken steps to reduce the number of places that the kids can come in during the day. Um, part of it's financial, um, you know, paying for that officer to be there. Um, so those are some of the reasons why. It's not, it's not an easy question to answer or make a decision on. Well, I, I'd rather the safety of our students be more of a concern I, I understand completely.
So the answer is no, we haven't reached out to them yet. And I'm, you know, I, I don't want you to, you know, I don't want to get into a big debate, you know, as far as why we don't want to or if we're going to. I mean, I want to give you the answers that I have right now. Um, but not that I, we would not look into it, not that it's, it's going to be a continuing uh, discussion. But as of right now, we don't. We don't have anybody in the school. Yes? Has there been any talk um, at the primary and the grade school? I know there are certain like field trip days or um, the bug show or whatever that parents just freely come in and you don't have to sign in anymore because it's a, you know, a large group of people accounting for those days? Because at that point, it seems like an easy time for any random person to just come in all of a sudden. It is, and the only time is probably the bugs play and Valentine's Day, um, trying to get everybody to sign in. That is one. That is just something that we really need to look at because we do. That's why everybody who comes in, you know, we make them sign in because if there is an incident, we have to know that you're in there. Um, it's just one of those times trying to figure out how to corral all of those people and to make sure that they're in there. And so, really, that's just one of those things we have to work out. Because we have gotten it down to just those certain days that, that we do, we go ahead and let them go through. Um, but, and when concerts, we have our fall concert, we let them come in, we don't make them. We're trying to figure out a way to do it, but we just haven't figured that out yet. Just real quick, you know, um, so we talk about balance a lot, and you, you have to balance all this, and it, it, these are difficult decisions. Um, you know, our, our first goal is always the safety of the kids. And I know that's easy to say. Um, we could lock the school down, you know, as tight as the jail, but I don't know if that's the best thing for the kids. And uh, so we have to find a balance to, to, you know, to, you know, we have kids, we've got a green greenhouse outside. The kids go out to the greenhouse. Our weights run outside. Our PE goes outside every day. Um, we're hopefully going to have a ag center where our kids are going to walk outside to class. Um, you know, do we stop doing that? Do we just keep them in the building? You know, we put them on a bus. There's, you know, there's dangers. You know, anywhere you go, there. So we, we we have to find a balance, and that's one of the difficult things. And that's why I said this is this is a hard discussion to have and a hard um, answer to give. But you know, we're constantly looking for balance. Things we can control, obviously, there's some we can't do budget and all that. Got it. In an instance, uh, issues we can't control, like are the kids being taught, uh, if they're seeing certain certain signs, I don't want to start profiling people. Uh, you know, if their son or daughter comes home, there's an issue with a child that's having some trouble. Uh, is there things in place that these kids are able to go that not be made fun of or, or telling the teacher that this gentleman's having an issue? You know, those are things we can't control. Is that thing being documented? So every, at the beginning of every year, we have assemblies with the kids. These are, we have those exact conversations. Um, there's, there's a movement, see something, say something. Um, these are all things that we talk to the kids all the time. Uh, we went through trainings, and I know one of the conversations, or one of the pieces that Joe said was, you know, these, these people try to find volumes when they're trying to do these um, horrible things. And so this room here is a prime example of a bad place to be, or, or Something bad would happen. So we've gone through earlier this year, and we had training, pulled the kids out of class, had them sit where they sit at lunch, pulled them by lunches, you know, did an all call, had them run into the different rooms, and I think it was probably less than a minute, 40 seconds, we were able to clear the room out. Now, you know, that's it's great. Uh, we've done drills during uh, passing periods. You know, it's great if you're in a classroom and a teacher goes and locks the door and you go and hide. But what happens if you're in a passing period? What do the teachers do? You know, that, that student is walking down the hallway. So we've gone through the, all these kind of drills. And I, I'm sure the grade school has the same kind of, kind of conversations. Um, we get kids to come and report things all the time. Like Joe said, we first thing we do, we all have Mike's cell phone. We'll call Mike up, hey Mike, we've got something going on. And they're up here within minutes. So um, 
don't know if you had anything else. I well, did it is. I mean, we've had things, incidents that the kids will come and tell us. They'll tell a, a teacher. They'll tell another kid. Another kid knows that they need to come and tell a teacher or an adult. If it's on Instagram, on Snapchat, whatever, they come tell us. Even if we, if we don't investigate. I mean, if it's something that we feel is a threat and it is a threat, we automatically call the police. And like then it's out of our hands. But those the police come in, they do a thorough investigation. You, we can't call and tell you every time. I know there's a lot of parents, you know, the last time we had something happen at the grade school that was all out there on Facebook and everything. We can't put a lot of stuff out. The only thing we can keep telling you is at these meetings is I can guarantee you, and I think Mike will back me up on this, we call them every time. If, if there is something that is a threat or we even think it is, we're going to look into it. In, in the past year also, we've uh, the St. Clair County judges put a program on uh, talking about reasons of bullying and, that, and educating the kids, signing and basically the consequences that could happen to them uh, posting stuff on social media. So we've done it at the grade school. We uh, had that for the seventh and eighth graders. And, and last year of uh, this school year, we did freshman, sophomore, one day, or in the morning, and then later on it was junior, senior. And then the next day at the high school, uh, the judges spoke on seven reasons why to leave a party. So. I think educating our kids also is beneficial as well. Have you guys discussed anything as far as mental health nurse? I mean, you might not be there yet, or financially, I'm not sure that's huge. I'm not advocating either way. I right. just don't know where your plans to discuss that. We, we've had those discussions, and, and uh, yes, financially, it would be difficult. The other thing is they have to be manned by somebody that is trained. Um, like I said earlier, we have 23 entrances into the building. So, you know, we talk to the kids about not opening the doors for anybody, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it would be pretty difficult to do that. Not just the money, but also how do you, you know, who, who's going to man that? We had a, uh, a bomb threat here probably five years ago, six years ago, or more than that, seven or eight years ago. And so we had it set up where we isolated the entrance, we had police come in, we searched bags, and we did all those kind of things. But it was, it was very difficult because you have so many entrances into the building. You know, this, this isn't like a, a bubble west where you have one single building, everybody pretty much stays inside. It's just, so but we've had those discussions and we continue to have it. Well, It's, it's, we've talked about it, but nothing serious. Yes? What type of safety devices or measures do teachers have uh, in their classroom to help keep the students safe? For us, we, we installed the locks. So double-sided locks, previously we had locks that were on one side, only the outside of the classroom, and, and we did not have universal keys. So teachers had keys to just their room, so they could not block anybody else's room if they were subbing. So now they can lock the key from the inside. They can lock the door from the inside. There, there's a few safety items that, uh, uh, first aid type items that they have in the room. Does that apply to the elementary and primary schools as well? What we as we have the locks, we have another uh, brace that they can put in the doors. We also last year um, made sure that all of the windows, all of the doors, all of our doors have windows on them. They have curtains on them that now that are rolled up. All they have to do is untie them. The curtain comes down, nobody can see in. Um, I do know some of the upper grade teachers, and I think some of the lower ones too, um, even when we're doing our drills, they have kids assigned to jobs that pulling uh, filing cabinets or bookshelves over. I know there are a couple teachers who have, if you go in their rooms, you will see lined on the chalkboard um, canned foods. And that canned food is not there for them to eat. They know that if, if an intruder gets in there, they start throwing. So there are different things that the teachers have come up with from going through these trainings that they have talked about. So I have a question. Um, so we're talking a lot about the educating and training piece. Um, can I ask what, what the teachers are going through as far as training and educating the teachers? Are, are they, are they, do they have a procedure or protocol that each classroom is supposed to talk, talk about to the students? Um, because sometimes I think when my kiddos come home, situational scenarios and so I was just curious if there's like a procedure to see 
the teachers knew, they knew weeks before to talk to the kids about it. Um, they all have their jobs. After it was done, the teachers were to talk to them, to you know, to talk about how, if anything had gone wrong or anything. We did send home a letter that said we, we did do the drill. It went well, you know, continue that conversation with your kids that we're gonna continue with this. Um, you know, we, we've had numerous trainings with the teachers to tell them what to talk about their kids and give them preliminaries because, but it's like Mike says, everything is different. You know, we, rooms are different. Rooms are different whether they have big windows or small windows. Um, so I don't know what kind of difference in vocabulary you're talking about. Sure. The language that we're mostly using with kids is that they have to follow the lead of the teacher. You know, that if they know, if, if they are outside and they, they, when they have talked to the upper grade kids to tell them where our secondary locations are, um, but you don't want one kid running, you know, whenever you're in a room, they're going to have to listen to that adult. I don't know if that kind of, I, I'm, I'm still kind of vague. I guess I'm just looking for something, you know, because I have one kiddo that thinks that they're supposed to run. If there's any way that they're supposed to, they're supposed to run and they're supposed to go out and they And they're nervous as heck. certain members that see a lot of bad stuff on a daily basis and then they're supposed to come home and flip the light switch off and think life is normal and it's, and it's not for them. But the big thing is communication and letting them talk and then express what they're feeling and then you helping them with that. Um, I mean, that was kind of my plan with the, this whole thing is are, is the Freeburg Police Department prepared for this? How the city administrators, are, are they prepared for this? And it's basically sitting down and getting a plain paper and pencil and we're writing stuff down. And we've met several times and like, okay, we found something else. It's basically, it's communication. Most experts, I think, like would tell you that depending on the age of every child, So I think that's why we're trying to train the teachers and, and relying on the teachers to make the decision. Um, you know, we give them options. You know, they can, if they think they can get out, they get out. If they feel like they need to lock themselves in, they do. And if they need to fight, they do that. Um, it's, it's, it's 
probably a lot more productive for us to train the teachers to make those decisions than it is to try to teach kids to make that decision. Um, they, they just don't function at the same level as, as teachers do. So, and as far as the uh, vocabulary, I mean, if you go on the internet and type in active shooter, you're probably going to find a dozen different acronyms and what to do, whether it's Alice or whether, and, and every, you know, schools will grab onto that and that's what they do. Um, so I think the message is, you, you, you know, you need to listen to the teacher and if, if we find, and apparently you're saying that maybe that message is not coming through well enough, well then that's on us to go back to the teachers to try to explain to them what, what steps. There's a good group of people here, but how are you going to get this information out to everybody else? Um, we are live streaming this whole um, presentation, and it's going to be on the school, the high school's YouTube page. And so I sent out something on Facebook today that said that. So um, hopefully somebody, my wife, I'm Lisa, uh, is watching this right now. Uh, but um, so that's one way: is that this is recorded, the presentation's been recorded. So people can access that, um, and we'll send out information. I mean, can probably send stuff out too to to uh, go to that resource. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, so that that's one way. Uh, but again, through our conversations with the teachers, our conversations with the kids, it's it's like Joe said, it's about training and repeating this. Um, and and there's a whole lot of other things that we do. You know, we still do fire drills. We did a tornado drill not too long ago. So there are, there are a lot of things that we still do and uh, to, you know, about the safety of kids and, and, and worry about that. Like, does every kid know that phone number to call? You know, like you've given an example, if you had a third grader run out of grade school and ran home, are they gonna know to call the city hall and say, hey, I came home and... This is the first time that this has been publicly put out. Okay. So this, is, this was part of this plan was to have this evening and to have this conversation, and then we can put that information out. We'll probably put it on our website. I think the village is going to have it on their website. Same with the grade school. But no, this is this is the first night that we're doing this. Can we put that phone number on the back of the ID? That's been that discussed. Like all one thing, and it either all gets lost or it doesn't. We, we've talked about that, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Do the teachers, or I'm sorry, do the students to let them know that there is somebody there. 
to help them. There is not. There's been such a big discussion on what, you know, what do we do with them when we go outside for recess? Because you don't want the kids outside with the lanyard on running around. We have enough trouble with the kids falling down, getting hit. Um, just the logistic of it, trying to figure out what to do, is our problem. I think at the high school with no recess, no, you know, going outside like that, you know, PE, it, it's easier for them to start. And then maybe we can see a trickle down. Um, you know, maybe it's something that we start with after the high school does it a year or whatever, then we start with eighth grade. And we start with seventh and see how we can then move it down to those younger kids and how we can control it. I think it might be important for the younger kids, especially if they get scared. Just to, It might be hard for them to remember parents' names, phone numbers, you know, in an emergency, thinking of like a kindergartner or a first grader, just I think my mom's name is, but I don't remember her phone number. Well, they were, well I mean, I, I, our plan is to get them to Adam's auction. There are teachers who work, the teachers will be in charge of this, the classroom in their bags. They have, each classroom has an emergency bag that has first aid kits, has their class list on them, you know, so they can have the kids' phone numbers. Up at Adam's auction, we have all of our uh, parent information, who can and who can't sign stuff out who can and can't sign the student out. So all of that information is on paper or it is on, we can get it on our phones also, if we need to, so just in case that kid doesn't remember. So she mentioned that we have, we, we put binders together with all the vital information, and I wanna reemphasize something that uh, uh, Joe said. So you, you, you're, you will not be able, or nobody will be able to pick up their child unless they're on the, the uh, emergency pickup list. So that's why you need to make sure you go through teacher ease and, and make sure it's updated. But on teacher ease, we are able to print out a picture along with the information. So, so if the child comes and nobody recognizes the child, they can you know, match them up with the picture. So these are things that we're trying to do. All that's been out at Adams for a while, that we put that all together. That'll get updated um, on a regular basis. You can't have a um, you can't have a uh, door that locks from the inside in the school. You're not allowed to have that. So you have to have a key. Yeah. This, you know, there's devices I've seen on you know, that you can get that kids can put in the door to to secure it. Is, do we have stuff like that? Or our students have they been taught how they can secure the door? Some ideas on what to do. So like Tommy said, most of our teachers have kids in high school, it's easier that they actually push cabinets, push things in front of the door. Um, there is a big debate on the legality of having a mechanical device. And so that's why the school um, went through the process, the high school went through the process of putting those uh, double-sided keys in and not, not going through that mechanical device. At the school where I teach, our door is locked from the inside. I teach at an Illinois school. All it is is a button, boom, you push it, it's locked. And the police that came and trained us all made sure we had the PVC pipe put over that mechanic alarm. I don't, I don't know about the advice you're getting about the legalities, but our district has. It's from our lawyer, yeah. and it's from, it's from, you know, the conferences that we go to, the, the legal experts around the state tell us the same thing. That's why we're looking at trying to figure out 
Um, do we put another door lock on the door? Do we just secure with that one lock that's there um, to make sure that's locked? Because I think, you know, it's minutes that they go through. They're, the intruder's looking for a door that's unlocked. Whether you have 10 locks on the door, if you have one lock on the door, as long as that door's locked, hopefully they're not, gonna get, they're not going to just stop and get in. They're gonna try and find a door that's unlocked. So it's that debate. But if, if you have anything that is double locked, you get written up for fire truck. It's a violation. I'm trying to figure out what that uh, It would probably be better at the school level because schools are all different. They all have different rules. They have different ways that they handle things. So, but no, that's it. I, I appreciate very much bringing that up because that's why we want to have these. We want to inform you, but we also want input. And uh, we don't know, we don't have all the answers. Our plan isn't perfect, and so that's we're constantly looking for better ways to do things. So that's a great. supposed to go through the door, they're supposed to, if they see kids, pull kids into the hallway, and then 
lock the door from the inside. And then we have spots where the kids are supposed to hide, they're supposed to be out of the way. I think my I think my point was more of in that in that one off situation where the teacher's not in the room. So what is what are the what are the students able to do to protect themselves? Smaller children, they're not gonna necessarily know what to do unless we make it extremely simple for them. And and probably the smaller kids are not gonna hopefully be in a room where they're unattended. It's just for maybe it, you know, if the, the teacher goes and I don't know if this happens, the teacher goes to the bathroom, it just happens to be that time and place. You know, what are the simple things that can be that simple deterrent just so that intruder goes to that door, um, can't get in here and go to the next one. Um, so that was kind of probably more of a comment was more geared for. Well, and I think it's a, with, with our kids, they, they can push the button and they can lock the door. And I think at the primary center, I know Mrs. G is back there. I mean, the teachers have done such a great job over there bringing it down to their level with what they need to do and staying calm. Um, hopefully they're, you know, the teachers are supposed to be with their classes all the time. Um, so hopefully they're going over and we're having our early dismissal tomorrow. So these questions that you're bringing up and stuff, we're going to talk about with the teachers tomorrow. And that's a, that's a good thing. The one thing you asked about with the ID badges, um, still trying to figure out how a kindergartner or even a third grader can hold on to it. We have badges on the uh, backpacks of the kids that ride the buses, whether they're red, yellow, or green. If they're kindergartner or they're red, they can't get off. Um, Mrs. G, how many times do you have to go through and put those back on the backpacks? <laughs> and they lose them, you know, that they're, they're gone. You know, trying to make sure we have such a hard time getting the elementary kids to bring back a book. Try to remember to bring back a, a badge. And I, I'm not trying to make excuses for them. We're just trying to figure this out because we think this is a good idea. But trying to figure out what is going to work is the hard thing. So that's that's what we're looking at, trying to figure it out. No, I applaud you guys for doing it. I mean, this is not something fun to talk about. Um, and it's, in a, it's a work in progress. So, I mean, I applaud the city and the administrators for getting this process going, inviting the public to come and uh, have these conversations. So, so thank I, you. I will brag on them for just a minute because we were at our uh, regional office of education, our superintendent's meeting today, and Joe was there and talking. And uh, how many other districts are in this uh, situation who are who are, have started this plan? I mean, none, none, have none have started this. They're talking. None of were at this point. They were because we talked about what we were doing. You know, getting the village and working with the police and having this plan um, in place. So, and this this was from the village and the school from us getting together. So, um, I applaud the village and the and the police department for starting this conversation for helping to try and get everything. So we know, you know, those questions are which roads can you come in on? Which roads are we going to shut down? Those are things that we can't predict. We can't manage but they can and they've got it done so that's one less thing that we have to worry about any other questions comments go ahead okay like i said like we're all said this is a work in progress um we continue to have the drills we continue to have these conversations you know go out Maybe we'll have another one that we, you know, and hopefully we will get more. We're trying to get the word out. We got it out the best that we could. Um, just know that we, this is a constant thing that is on our mind. We're trying to figure out how to keep everyone safe when they were, when they are at our buildings, whether it be extracurricular or uh, during the school day. If you have any questions or thoughts, don't hesitate to contact any of the administrators, police, anything. If you have questions or suggestions. Thank you all for coming. Oh, question.